built for big musicals, the St. James Theatre on West 44th Street has presented both traditional fare and shows that push the stylistic envelope. It's been home to many long-running hits, including the original productions of classics Oklahoma, The King and I, Hello, Dolly, and The Producers. The Hello, Dollies and the Barnums and the, on the 20th centuries, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's amazing to, to realize what, what level of talent have been through the doors of the St. James, sat in the seats, and were in, the, in those dressing rooms. James is my middle name, Thomas James Toon, so I always identified with it. You know, the saintly part of me identified with the St. James. It is my favorite theater. I think it's just great. It speaks to, I think, the intimacy and the experience uh, that the audience and the artists have in this theater, um, because even though it is such a large capacity seating-wise, its, its feeling and its experience is, is a very intimate one. The audience uh, stage relationship, the orchestra, is so intimate, you know, and if you can get them from there, then it spreads. Uh, I could feel it there. This is an, one of the old theaters in New York, and, oh, that's, no, it, it, I could tell. Center stage at the St. James is a very, very nice place to be. The theater was originally named for tough producer Abe Erlanger. George M. Cohen opened the Erlinger's Theater in 1927, um, and as part of that restoration in 1999, we found the original advertising sign for that show and restored it, and it's now, uh, you can see it downstairs. Erlanger was not the most popular producer on Broadway, and in 1932, not long after his death, the theater was rechristened the St. James after the St. James Theater in London. The first full-length production of Hamlet in the United States played here and it was reportedly five hours with a dinner break and you know it's, it's an interesting thing that this house which is one of the largest on Broadway at 1700 seats um, has worked so beautifully both for large musicals and for uh, more intimate plays. The St. James got its first true classic in 1940 with Rodgers and Hart's Pal Joey starring the pre-Hollywood Gene Kelly as a conscience-free gigolo. Three years later, the history of Broadway musicals was changed forever with the opening of Rodgers and Hammerstein's first musical together, Oklahoma. The buzz from out of town was mixed on the show. Some people liked it a lot. The famous quote attributed to Walter Winchell, no gals, no gags, no chance. But when the New York sophisticated opening night audience heard the show, what must have happened at that moment was the realization that the modern integrated musical theater piece as we know it was really born. The St. James Theater became a favorite of Rodgers and Hammerstein's, who opened two more hits there, The King and I with Yul Brenner and Gertrude Lawrence. The original poster said Gertrude Lawrence in The King and I. Actually, out of town, Yul Brenner was on a line with four, three other people. They did elevate him up when it was out of town. I remember James Hammerstein explained to me that he had gone out of town to see the King and I, and he said to his father afterwards, he was he was embarrassed for Gertrude Lawrence, because this extraordinary force of nature, Yul Brynner, just took the show away from her. The next time Jamie saw the show was the first preview in New York, and as he said to me, Gertrude Lawrence walked out on stage, and he was like, oh my God, she's the star. And it took her a while to sort of let him find his place and then she would step up to hers. Rogers and Hammerstein's next show was Flower Drum Song starring Larry Blyden and Pat Suzuki. Rogers and Hammerstein went back to the St. James for Flower Drum Song in 1958, a show that proved not to have the staying power of the rest of their shows, um, but still it was a success in its time and um, and again, Jamie Hammerstein was an original stage manager of it, and he said that they, he always felt that when business started to taper off a little bit for Flower Drum, they closed it too early, that there was more of an audience. Gene Kelly directed Flower Drum Song, but Carol Haney did the choreography. One of the last of the Dream Ballet, something which is off parody in this day and age. In 1957, the St. James became the flagship of Jew Jamson Theaters, which still owns it today. A big restoration was in 1999, and that's when so much of the work you see here was really restored to its original splendor. It takes a lot of wear, and it should. These buildings aren't museums. Seats take a beating, carpeting takes a beating, 
And so it is not our job to prevent that. It is our job to facilitate that and to be as special for the audience today as it was last year, as it was 10 years ago, as it was 50 years ago, as it was 100 years ago. Uh, and now it is a daily process of maintaining to that level. I will tell you there is a single chair at the back of the balcony that I think is a magical seat. And it's so unusual, I think, to sit and watch that communal experience and watch a show with nobody on either side. It's so unusual. Um, and I like that seat a lot. When I was a kiddo, I saw an early preview of Hello Dolly and I sat in the one seat at the top of the second balcony there is one row that is just one seat and I sat in that seat seeing Carol Chang in Hello Dolly. 1964 brought the St. James's biggest homegrown hit Hello Dolly with Carol Channing as the matchmaker Dolly Gallagher Levi. You know I think Dolly is one of our most beloved characters and musicals certainly um, Carol Channing gave an indelible performance. It was just the best thing you've ever seen in your life. I mean, you know, she was, she has the ability to give you a close-up. At that, that seat, you get a close-up of Carol Channing. Something about her reads further than the rest of us. It was also played by many other remarkable women on this stage. Pearl Bailey, Ethel Merman, Ginger Rogers. My one and only, Tommy Toon, Twiggy, the top hats, the canes, the tails, and of course, you know, tune at the James is classic. Stage left. Stage. You, you come in the stage door and there it is. Right. Famous dressing room at the St. James. Sir Lawrence Olivier told me that that was his dressing room when he was there in Man for All Seasons, I think. And then, uh, of course, Carol Channing. When you say the, uh, so many great actors were there, I, I feel, I felt it there. I felt that. And, and uh, the Barrymores and all that sort of thing. The people that came to see my one and only, that came into that dressing room, Jacqueline Onassis was there, Kirk Douglas. <laughs> when I opened the door, it was Charlton Heston, he filled the door. Many actors who've played the St. James believe that the theater is haunted by a highly unusual ghost, a laughing ghost. This ghost is never seen, but is heard laughing during some performances. I've heard a strange laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it was it definitely not with the jokes. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is all news to me. Have you ever heard the laughing ghost? I, I have not. I, I somehow the ghosts don't come to me so much. Theater people love the theater, you know. And of course, when everybody goes home and they put the ghost light out, what are we to do but to come out and put on a show? That's all we know how to do. Yeah, you know, I'll probably be doing that in another life. However, the ghost never stopped the parade of hits at the St. James. Jim Dale played master showman P.T. Barnum in Cy Coleman's circus musical, Barnum, in 1980. It was a full-on circus musical. Jim Dale and Glenn Close and Lilius White told the most moving story. Oh, I remember that really well. Michael Cerverus made his Broadway debut as the pinball-playing title character in the 1993 rock musical, The Who's Tommy. Nathan Lane gave the performance of his career so far as the conniving Max Bialystok in the stage adaptation of Mel Brooks's The Producers. I was here on opening night. There are these moments in the theater you sort of know that you're sitting watching history. Um, and that's what that felt like. In recent years, the St. James has hosted Patti LuPone's volcanic performance as Madame Rose in Gypsy and offered a new musical about alienated teens, American Idiot, based on the album by the rock group Green Day. Anchoring the southwest corner of the Broadway Theater District, the St. James is one of the largest and most sought after Broadway theaters. To think about this stage and, and to look out into these seats and think through the decades and decades and decades of truly unique moments of theater. I think it's why the building feels as, as full as it does, even when it's empty, as it is now.